My name is Brian. Chapter 6. Chapter 6 is titled, Richie, Two Points Plus Isabel Points. How's it going, Brain? My sister Hillary asks as she passes me a baked potato. I kicked her under the table. Hey, quit it, she yells. Brian, my father snaps. She's bugging me, I tell him. Just be quiet and eat your dinner, he says. Hillary can keep talking, though. Mom, she says, I have to go to the library right after dinner. Hillary, my mother tells her, you have to help with the dishes before you go anywhere. Now that I'm helping Brian with his homework, you'll have to pitch in more than ever. If you're helping Brian, then Brian should do the dishes, she says. While you help your father with the dishes and I do the laundry, Brian will be busy giving Tyson his bath and putting him to bed. Old Hillary doesn't give up. Mom, I have to go to the library to do research for history class. Schoolwork is my job, you always said. Doing the dishes is your job too, my father tells her. No one ever helps me with my homework, Hillary says. No one has to, my father answers with his first smile of the evening. It's not Brian's fault, my mother says. After all, he didn't ask to be dyslexic. I mumble, I didn't ask to be born either. My father glares at me. Everyone's trying to help you, Brian, my mother says. Don't start trouble. I don't enjoy my dinner very much after that, but giving Tyson a bath isn't half bad. When he's all sweet smelling and dressed in his baseball pajamas, I lift him up to pop him into the crib. When he sees where he's headed, he starts kicking and cries. Brian, rock Tyson. Mommy rocks Tyson. I sit down in the rocking chair with him, and he clutches his radio blanket and looks up at me. Brian, read. He orders. Mommy reads. I pick out a frog and toad book from the pile next to the rocker and open it. I show him a picture of frog and toad walking together. Look, I say, they're walking down the road. Read words, he orders. So I read by sounding out the words and following the syllable rules that my tutor taught me. Whenever toad is talking in a story, I make my voice low. When it's frog's turn, I start and end his speech with ribbit. Tyson loves this and doesn't even notice that I'm a slow reader. The next night, I read him Frog and Toad again. And by the third night, I'm pretty sick of reading the same book over and over and decide to go to the library and pick out some new books for him. Ones that I'm sure I can read. Friday, Mr. Dithers announces that we're starting a unit on the American Revolution and we should take notes. Brian, he says, I understand that you are to sit in the front row. Please change places with Irene. As I pass Dan on the way to the front, he asks, what'd you do? I shrug my shoulders and whisper back, I guess because I'm always fooling around. I sit down, and as soon as people have stopped staring at me, I take out the tape recorder Miss Crandall gave me. At home, I wrapped it in a paper napkin and practiced pressing the record button without looking at it. With this disguise, I figure no one will notice what I'm actually doing. As I'm putting the napkin-wrapped recorder on my desk, Mr. Dither says to the class, Whenever the class take notes, Brian is going to record my lecture. As you probably know, he has a learning disability. He also will be able to spend as long as he needs to on tests. I slump down in my seat. How could he do this to me? No fair, Jason calls out. Why should he have more time? Mr. Dither spends five minutes lecturing us on how everyone has different abilities and learning styles and makes me feel like a world-class joke. I don't have any choice, I tell the other jokers at lunch. If I don't go to the tutor and get better grades, my dad will kill me. I can't do anything about it until I live on my own. Hey, man, just say no, John says. Your folks won't kick you out. You don't know my father, I tell him. Yes, I do, John answers. He's no different from any father. You're just wimping out, man. You gotta start talking back more. Look, look at him like you'd beat him up if he dared lay a hand on you. Use your karate on him. A tutor? Give me a break. Before I can think of a way of changing the subject, Isabel comes clumping past our table with her lunch tray. Richie calls out, Hey, Isabel, you dropped something. She automatically leans over her tray and looks at the floor. At that distance, Richie does a hand fart. A whole table of 8th grade guys hear it and laugh. We start scratching our heads. Isabel glares at me as if it's my fault. Two points, Richie bows, plus two is at eight points. Did you see her? She thought she really did it. No, she didn't, I said. She was mad. Maybe we should get extra points if we get somebody really mad, Richie says. 
I think that's a dumb idea, but I don't say so. Hey, it's Friday, Dan reminds me. We can all go to the hideout. Do you have tutoring, he asks. I'm not a prisoner, I tell him. I can still go to the hideout on Fridays. But I can't today, John says. Do you have to stay after, Dan asks. Me? Nah. Bingham won't pull that one on me again. I just got some business to take care of. You got trouble with that? Dan shakes his head. I can't go either, Richie says. I got to, you know, go someplace, the dentist. Better give me the week's moolah now, John says. We each give him two dollars, which he rolls in a wad and sticks in his back pocket. I'll put it in the tin when we get to the hideout tomorrow, he tells us. After school, I hang out with Dan for a little while, but he wants to go watch TV and I want to stay outdoors. I'm riding my bike around the shopping center thinking maybe I'll just go home and take Tyson to the playground when I hear honk honk. I look up. The Canada geese are on the move. I start going to the direction of the big goose V in the sky. Then I get this great idea about my report on the geese. I cycle as fast as I can on Route 343 toward the highest building around, the Colgate Mansion. I slow down when I remember the rule about not going to the hideout unless everyone can go. But I remind myself the hideout is in the gardener's shed, not the big house. I just want to go near the shed. I pedal full out of the rest of the way. After I hide my bike behind the garage, I sneak into the mansion through the cellar window John pried open last summer. The cellar smells like old socks and it's darker than I thought it would be. I get upstairs fast. I don't count rooms this time or look around. I'm too scared. On the top floor, I climb the ladder, push the hatch open, and pull myself onto the roof. Before I even look around, I take my tape recorder out of my knapsack and turn the tape over to the side B. Mr. Dithers is on side A and the Canada geese sounds will be on side B. Now that I'm on the roof, I'm not afraid. I like being up here where I can see my town laid out like a map. I'm looking for the roof of my house when I hear honk honk behind me. I push the record button on the tape recorder and hold it up to the sky. Microphone toward the via the geese headed my way. Then I get another idea and turn the microphone back toward me and say clearly, The sounds of the Canada geese, 4 p.m. October 2nd, 1992, as heard by Brian Albertini. The geese are flying in a southerly direction. They fly toward me again, honking like crazy. As they get close to the mansion, they take a dive. Are they going to land on the roof? I lie down on my belly so I won't scare them off. When I lift my head just enough to take a peek, I see that they haven't landed around me after all. I still hear honking, so I crawl over to the edge of the roof and look down. At least a hundred Canada geese have landed in the field next to the gardener's shed. I describe into the recorder what the geese look like and how they're feeding. I stop talking and try to count them, but it's hard to keep track because they keep moving around to feed. Bang! The crack of a gunshot explodes through the window of the shed. It sends the geese up and out of there with a swoosh of wings and a thousand honks. I scan the field. No dead bodies. The shot missed its mark, and all the geese have escaped. Five guys come out of the shed. Before I have a chance to think that some other kids have found our hideout, I see that two of the boys are Richie and John. The other three are eighth graders, real troublemakers, Teddy, Steve, and Mac. Mac is holding a hunting rifle. He shouts curse words at the flying geese and laughs. John and Richie have brought other people to our hideout. I lie as flat as I can, slide away from the edge of the roof, and lay there listening to them laughing and talking. With the honking geese gone, I can overhear what they say. There are more than 20 rooms in there, and no one's using them, John says. Now that should be the clubhouse, one of the 8th graders say. Is it Steve? Come on. We'll give you a tour, Richie says. You got a way to get in, John? Mac asks. What do you think? John answers. My heart jumps. I hear their evil laughter as they run toward the mansion. Bang! Another gunshot. As I look around the roof trying to describe what to do, or decide what to do, I notice the open hatch to the top floor. I crawl over to it and close it. I sit on it and think about all the mean things Teddy, Steve, and Mac have done to animals and kids. What would they do if they found me? An hour passes, minute by minute, it's getting darker and colder. I look at my watch, 6.03 p.m. I'm already late for dinner, and it starts to rain. I get this awful thought. What if they decide to stay all night? None of those guys are afraid of their parents. I tell myself, Brian, you've got to find a way out of this, even if five nutso guys are roaming around inside with a gun. 
I picture in my mind the layout of the mansion with its 27 rooms and network of hallways. I see it like an architectural design my dad would make. Then I imagine myself in this plan and try to figure a route for getting back down the four flights of stairs and through the cellar window without ever being seen. I shiver from the cold and sneeze. You jerk, I say out loud. You're not inside, you're outside. In my mind's eye, I move the imaginary me to where I really am, on the roof, outside the house. I add what's on the outside of the house to my plan. Three porches, a fire escape that goes from the roof to the beginning of the second story where I know there should be a lighter that can be dropped to the ground. I picture the pattern of the fire escape and compare it to the layout of the rooms. It follows the line of hall windows. I get off the hatch, walk to the edge of the roof, and climb onto the fire escape. Careful not to slip on the wet metal. I start my descent stair by stair. At each landing, I crawl under the window to keep out of sight from the guys inside. At the second floor, I lean over to the unhinge of the ladder that flips to the ground. It's rusted in place and won't budge. The drop to the ground is about 20 feet. I hear laughter and loud voices. I turn and see the beam of a flashlight approaching. I turn and see the beam of a flashlight approaching the window. If I jump, I risk breaking my leg. I estimate it's about three foot leap to the roof of the porch. I picture the porch with a smooth, rounded columns. I leap the three feet and hit the porch with a loud thump. What's that? A voice from inside shouts. I hear the sound of a window starting to open. I run to the edge of the roof, hoist myself over and slide down the column to the porch. I run across the lawn as fast as a goose flies. Will they think that I'm an animal and shoot me? I round the corner of the garage, jump on my bike, and ride through the woods and onto the highway. I never look back, and even though it hurts to breathe, I don't slow down until I'm riding down my own street. As I'm putting my bike into the garage, I wonder if tomorrow John will tell us about the guys he brought to the hideout. But the next day, I can't meet the jokers at the clubhouse. I can't go to my karate lessons either. I have to stay home the whole day because I was an hour late for dinner. I also have a terrible cold. Sunday morning, I go over to Dan's. This is one of my favorite things to do. Dan's father is not as nervous and grumpy as my dad, and he makes the best Sunday brunch with homemade blueberry pancakes. I'd like to bring Tyson with me sometimes so he can see what a family is like where the mother and father aren't always arguing with one another and yelling at the kids. After breakfast, Dan and I go to his room to build a model airplane. Dan says that he and Richie and John waited for me at the clubhouse on Saturday. That, is, that it was real boring, and after a while of just sitting around feeling cold and being quiet, John had said maybe it was time to close the hideout for the year. He said especially since you can hardly ever come. So he's blaming me, I say. He's the one who has new friends. What new friends, Dan asks. I tell him that John and Richie went to the hideout without us and that they took 8th graders. He doesn't believe me until I play him the tape recorder. I'm afraid of those guys, Dan says. I don't even like them, I tell him. And they're in trouble all the time. Big trouble. Nan's looking sad, but John and Richie and you and me, we're all best friends. I feel pretty bummed out myself. I'm thinking that I just don't trust John with our money anymore. But just thinking that makes me feel sad and sort of sick to my stomach. So I don't say that out loud. Instead, I tell Dan, I don't like Operation JDBR that much anymore. It brings me more grief than relief. It's hard for you to fool around in school now anyway, Dan says. I don't blame you for being afraid of your father. I hope you can get better grades. Me too, and make my life a whole lot easier. I can do better work in school too, Dan says. I was afraid you wouldn't be my friend if I did. I don't care if you study, I tell him. I know, he says, but John and Richie would be real mad if I started to be good in school. Are you afraid of them too, I ask? He nods, yeah, a little. But people shouldn't be afraid of their friends. If you're afraid of someone, maybe they're not such a good friend, Dan adds. Maybe not, I agree.